ropes, but uh, so far things seem to be going well. Um, it's really great to welcome so many people here today. Um, I did, it is the third event that I've attended and sort of each one we seem to be talking about new members joining and that, and, and there's no let up on that. Today we actually have registered to attend the event over 180 people from 70 different organisations right across the spectrum of the public service. So that's just fantastic and we're really grateful for the, the support and engagement from yourselves. Um, and so in particular we have a couple of new members today, so just wanted to welcome people from the Irish Coast Guard. Letterkenny Institute of Technology, the LOCKS Agency, and the Nursing and Midwifery Board of Ireland. Um, so again, just, just really great to see that, that growth in, in the, the group. And I think it's, it's a testament to the value of it. And I think to all the work that both the membership and the secretaries have put in over the years to building it up. So just a couple of housekeeping things. Obviously we're in WebEx again today. Um, your microphones will be muted throughout the event and, and your cameras, basically only the presenters cameras will be enabled. We do have a box, which should be hopefully on the right hand side of your screen for questions and answers. So if I um, really would like, notwithstanding the limitations of WebEx, this to be as participative as possible. So please feel free to put in your your questions as you go along. We'll have an opportunity for just a couple of minutes, a couple of brief clarification questions with each speaker um, after their presentation. And then at the end, we'll have some more time for a wider question and answer panel discussion. So anything you want to share or put to the panelists, please um, feel free to, to use that Q&A. We have a, a very exciting panel with us this morning. Um, Three quite different, but I think quite interrelated topics. Ashling Highland from Fingal County Council is going to, to talk to us about a 3D modeling basis for planning the future of a town. Niall Noonan from South Dublin County Council is going to talk to us about participative budgeting, which is, I think, again, a really exciting sort of innovation and opportunity to get your hands on how the money is spent. And then Grania Curtin from the Policing Authority has come to talk to us about how to engage the citizens in determining policing priorities. And again, obviously something that has a huge impact on, on every citizen. So the overall theme of this morning is, is using citizen engagement to enhance service delivery. And it very much follows on from our last event, and many of you attended the event on the 23rd of June, where we talked about understanding and meeting customer needs. And I think a theme that sort of has emerged through these conversations is the idea that um, we as deliverers of public services just need to be very careful that we never arrogantly assume that we know the answer, that we know what's good for the citizen or whatever cohort of the citizen we were dealing with in any given service. So at the last session, and again there, we had some three really interesting speakers from the Gardaí talking about community um, policing from the local government community call during COVID and from the Department of Justice on, on using sort of analytical insights to develop the service models. So we're going to develop that theme further today by looking at participative models that really allow um, the citizen to not merely to access, but to actually influence the shape of service delivery models and service decisions. Um, and that really is sort of deepening almost a concept of not quite participative democracy, but certainly participative service development and service engagement. And really, I think developing that sort of interactive respect between ourselves as service as people involved in the delivery of public service and the community, the citizens who avail of those services. So very much looking forward to this morning's session. Um, so we're going to kick off now. We're going to hear from Ashling Highland, um, who's going to talk to us about the Dalbriggan's 3D model um, to enhance citizen engagement. And this is an immersive 3D virtual reality model of public realm rejuvenation products projects, I do beg your pardon. So, Ashling, the floor is yours. Thanks, Breen. Um, I'm just hopefully sharing my um, slides now. Um, yes, yeah, so as, as Breen said, my name is Ashling Highland and I'm Digital Strategy Manager um, for Fingal County Council. And today I'm going to just um, showcase the Balbriggan 3D model 
I'll explain a bit about the background to the project and um, its development and how we've gotten to the end product. And at the very end, we're going to just do a very short uh, video showcase so you can actually see what the model look that looks like. Um, so, first of all, Balbriggan. Why Balbriggan? Um, well, uh, we've developed a Balbriggan 3D model because there are significant public realm improvements planned for Balbriggan over the next five or so um, years. And this 3D model will help to bring these plans to life. Um, often a criticism of um, local government is that we, we put out all these consultations and these surveys, we get feedback from citizens, and then it takes years for the actual development um, of these public large public realm projects to take place. And so for for the interim, the citizen doesn't get to see that that all that work and all that development. They can't visualize what, what their um town centre, village centre is going to look like. And they may not hear from us um actively during that process. So this 3D model is a visual tool that we've developed, which will help citizens to vis visualize the planned transformations of the town outlined in the Erbal Brigan 2019 to 2025 town rejuvenation plan. And last year, um, we applied for funding under the Deepers um, Public Service Innovation Fund to develop the 3D virtual reality model to enhance its an engagement in Balbriggan. And we were awarded um, some 2,000 uh, euro uh, to put towards this project. And um, when we went to tender, a, a Galway-based company were successful. Um, so they've been working with us. They're called RealSim. And they've um, developed the model that you're going to see today. So what exactly did we develop? Well, the, the 3D model is viewable on three interactive platforms. And uh, initially, we uh, had intended for the, the model, this was before COVID hit, we were intending to develop just a, a virtual reality model that we could bring to, um, you know, community hall meetings and uh, schools, uh, events, that sort of thing. And we'd literally bring the VR headset with us and get kids and young people and people in the town um, trying on this VR headset and looking at the model in an immersive um, reality sense. Um, but then COVID hit, so we had to kind of reevaluate the project and see, okay, we still want people to have an immersive experience of the, the planned rejuvenation of Balbriggan, but how can we bring it to them? How can we bring it to their homes? We can't do events. So these were the platforms that were developed. So the um, web viewer was built um, primarily for community engagement, citizen engagement. And it's similar to a kind of Google Maps interface. So it uses simple commands that move around the streets and you can just double, double click on the screen and you're brought to an area on the street and you're immersed with what the, what the, the, the road, what the, the, the town centre will look like in a couple of years time. Um, we also developed the desktop viewer. So this is primarily for our own staff in the council. So primarily the planning and architect staff would, would be using the desktop viewer of the model. It gives additional functionality and um, so you can manipulate the model, you can add buildings, you can drag and drop and look at the shading of a building and look at the different times of year and how the sun casts shadow and um, that sort of thing. So it's really an interactive tool for the planning and architect staff to use. Um, and then the VR viewer, we still have that um, inbuilt functionality. So when we do finally get to you know, events where we feel comfortable to use VR headsets in, you know, a showcase sort of um, event with the community, we'll be able to bring bring that element, that immersive element um, to the town. So um, how did we create this model? Um, well, first of all, the model can be best described as a 3D map or digital twin. 
of Balbriggan as it's created using aerial survey photography and ground level survey photography. So this um, image here is of the terrain mapping. Um, the, the, you'll see the change in the surface now. You'll see the surface um, topography. And here is now the aerial mapping. So we've used um, accurate uh, aerial photography um, to map the area. And the underlying uh, data is all accurate as well. So it's it's a real, I suppose, digital twin of Valbriggan itself that's been created. And the modeling of the treating model that you'll see at the end of this, um, I, I suppose, is, is, is textured textured in three different levels. So this uh, this um, this uh, uh, first layer or level. Um, of modeling is this blocky texture. So the the outskirts of the town where we're not, um, I suppose, delivering uh, huge changes, uh, we, we've developed this blocky texture. It doesn't take up too much data for the model and it's not going to change hugely. So we've blocked all the buildings like this towards the outskirts of the town, but it, they're factual um, replications of actual buildings. The second um, level there is slightly more enhanced. So it's got the addition of 2D photography layered onto those blocky textured buildings. So it just gives additional, I suppose, um, realness to the, the, the baseline model that we have. And then finally, the, the third layer there is a more real three dimensional view of a building. So this is quite a significant building in Balbriggan. And you'll be able to see the different uh, depth perception in the model, the likes of the balconies there, the overhang, the shading, that sort of detail. Um, this sort of detail obviously takes a lot of development and is quite quite enhanced and quite detailed. It takes a lot of um, operating power and data from the model. So you wouldn't be doing the whole town to this uh, level, it would just be the main kind of um, areas where you're showcasing developments. So this slide, I suppose, just sums up what I've what I've briefly spoken about there. So we've got our our baseline data um, with the uh, geofenced area of Balbriggan that we've um, accurately mapped as a digital twin with the aerial photography. Then we have our web viewer. And we have uh, our desktop viewer as well, and uh, the way we can uh, let citizens view it as well through uh, VR technology. So that just gives a, a brief overview of, I suppose, the technical side of the model and how it was developed. Um, but its purpose was primarily for citizen engagement. So we launched the model back in June of this year. And uh, we plan to add to it. So as areas are developed, as areas in the rejuvenation plan, the harbour, um, we've got big developments ar around the main street and refurbishing buildings. So as we have um, designs of um, these new buildings, uh, we, we can layer them onto the existing model that we have now, and that's available for citizens to view in real time. So they'll be able to see you know, the future um, main street area where there's a huge a, a range of uh, buildings that are getting completely re refurbished and some buildings are um, getting demolished for a nice greenway um, area as well. So they'll be able to see all those changes before they happen and as they're happening as well. Um, we've also uh, have a number of community engagement uh, webinars and uh, Thankfully, now some in person events as well coming up in the next couple of months um, with the community in Bob Briggins. So we have a community engagement hackathon taking place in October. You see there from the image the dates. And we also have a schools hackathon where we're bringing this model um, to each secondary school in Bob Briggins and we're just informing them about it. and. I suppose getting them to use it, get their feedback and um, showcasing it as well. 
uh, and we'll also have staff seminars and then for I suppose next steps beyond that we'll be training up staff to be able to use the model and interact with it um, we're also adding additional uh, consultation survey questions and feedback um, to the model itself so at the moment we get uh, good data on the usage of the model, but we don't have, um, I suppose, built in questions or survey questions at the moment. So we're adding that feature to it. Um, and we're also going to explore different use cases. So this model, the raw data of it is going to be available to businesses to use, to create apps on to. So we're going to see if there are any other use cases for us um, with this model as we expand uh, from the pilot phase. And I might just ask now for the video to be played. So you'll see now in a second, this video was uh, created um, using the 3D model interface. So uh, you'll see that it's uh, it's a bit glitchy because it's literally me going and pointing on the screen and going to the you know the the place on the main street to see the what the building looks like now or what the building will look like in the future. These are the points of interest for the Airbell Brig and Rejuvenation Plan. So as we get those developments, as so we get the new designs of these areas. We can add those layers to the to the actual um, model itself, and we'll now go into the harbour area of Balbriggan. So all of this area has been uh, 3D mapped in that uh, layer tree texture that I explained earlier. So it's got the quite a lot of detail. You can mess around with the sundial and see what it's like at different times of the day, different times of the year. All these buildings here don't exist at the moment. They're all um, just in, in a design phase. Um, so we're, we're able to showcase to people what, um, what the area will look like, which is in, a, I suppose, a more immersive environment um, that we're used to. I suppose it's not just on paper or just on a website you can interact with this model drag and drop and see uh, what it could what it's going to to look like in the future and um, there's also quite a unique feature and i think it'll come up now in a second um that you can uh, view the model in different scenarios so for the model here we've um added in a Kind of festival toggle view so we can see the place as, as it's you know a normal day people are walking having lunch but we when we toggle to the festival view we can see the place transform into having an event that's taking place so you'll see um, a stage now and music and stalls um, where you can create a bit of a buzz about the place and see it can be used in different ways and this can help as well to i suppose bring people on board for plans as well when they're thinking of the changing of a particular use of um an urban or a, a, a village center and um, that you can see a, a multi-use purpose in more more of a visual way so this is a I suppose the majority of the the model is based in this harbour area, but then it goes into the the main street and this area here. Once we have um, further design plans, we can we'll be adding to this layer and giving uh, that layer tree textured uh, detail. So I think that's the end of the video. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ashley. God, that's absolutely fascinating stuff. Um, I, I never played Sims myself, but um, it does look like Balbriggan getting the Sim treatment. Um, you know, to anybody who's ever looked at things like good old county development plans and local development and local area plans, we're kind of used to looking at two dimensional maps with shades of and for some reason, lots of shades of pink. I've never quite understood why that color is so important, but 
the immersive piece is, is, is just really good. And I do love that concept that you mentioned of sort of bridging the gap between consultation and actuality, because um, that can be quite long. Question for you, um, I might have picked you up wrongly. I thought you mentioned um, a 2000 euro grant or funding. 20, I, 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 20 sorry. 20, yeah. Ah, that explains. No, I was thinking I was looking at a lot more than 2000 yes, euros of development yeah. there. I, I'm really interested in the, um, I suppose, how this could develop into, because if I understand correctly at the moment, you do the consultation, the designers do their thing or the, the planners, and then this gives the public an opportunity to see what it's going to look like, or is it what it might look like? Is there an opportunity for further engagement from the model? Yes. There is, and I suppose the the designs that you've seen at the moment, they are the initial designs from the architects. The there is a consultation phase on on the developments of of each of the areas in Belbriggan. So yes, there's air, there's um, mechanisms that we have where people can um, contribute and give their feedback to the designs um, through our consultation portal. And as well, now we're adding the added uh, questions and features to the model that we can ask questions directly onto it. And um, so, yeah, it's what you see is not exactly what it's going to look like because it's an iterative process and, and we'll have consultation all along the way, which is um, the same for any project really. Which is fantastic and of course, you have to face the fact that it will rain sometimes as well. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're constantly getting feedback from citizens um, through our consultation portal and now through this, um, this model as well. And as soon as we launched, we had feedback straight away on different elements that people wanted to see in the rejuvenation plan. Um, when we set aside the initial consultation, we had over 25% of the population in Brigham took part in a survey to develop this uh, rejuvenation plan. And part of it was to try and, uh, part of the feedback was to try and get more immersive consultation from the council to the citizen and likewise get that get that feedback flowing both ways. Um, so that's that's another reason why we've developed this model and through the funding of the Public Service Innovation Fund, we've been able to create this this pilot model, but we've now looked at other areas like swords master plans and other um, county development plans and, and expanding the model and having a more immersive experience for public consultation when it comes to to planning. Which is fantastic and I think um, I, I need to make a little trip down to Dunleary Town Hall and um, ask my local council when they're going to catch up with with yourselves in Fingal now because that's, that's really impressive. I don't think we have any audience questions just at the moment for you, Ashley. Yeah, we so. have two. Oh, we do. I beg your pardon. Yeah, yeah, I can read them out. So um, thanks, Caroline. Yeah, Vincent O'Reilly, he's asking which platform is being used to host and manage the model. And Jared Murray says the model is great. How much did it cost? Great. Well, the model cost us um, just the, the funding that we received, so the 20,000. Um, it's hosted using an Amazon web server, but um, we're, it's hosted through the, the our partner there um, who's developed the model RealSim. So it's on their um, platform that it's hosted. Um, but I can, I should have said earlier that uh, for the web viewer, I can send a link and put it in the chat or send it on to yourself, Caroline, so that people can play around with it as well. And we're always looking for feedback. So if there is feedback, um, we'd love to hear it. That's brilliant. Yes, and I see. Yes, I've, I've got my Q and A switched on now. I see Jared Murray has come back to say yes, please. And I think that goes for all of us, and hopefully an extra hundred and eighty people poking around and it doesn't <laughs> put undue pressure on your server, Ashling. Um, we'll certainly come back to you. There's obviously a lot of interest in this, so we'll come back to you in the panel discussion at the end. But you can relax for a little while, Ashling. Thanks again for your presentation. We're going to move on uh, to something. That again follows the same theme, but is quite different. Um, Niall Noonan from South Dublin County Council is going to 
talk about participatory budgeting and I have to say now every time you know whether it's the state budget or local budget or anything else there are always as many opinions as there are citizens and everybody thinks well if it was my decision I would have done something different and I would have done it better so what we're going to look at here is a real opportunity for it to be everyone's decision so looking forward to that Niall the floor is yours Niall? Have we got sound? Are you possibly on mute? So is anybody else hearing Niall? Um, no, I can't hear Niall either. None of us can. Okay. Sorry, Niall, you seem to have lost your sound we can go on to the next person yeah might be as well yeah. um we'll just have a chance to see if we can sort out whatever the, the gremlins have done to us yeah it's probably that enormously memory hungry application from balbriggan balbriggan has ground everything to a halt uh, i'm sure it's not but yeah um so i think that's probably best and we'll just take take an opportunity for niall to get we we'll see if we can find out what's causing the, the loss of sound there. So we'll move on. Grania, if you're ready, um, we have um, the, what was to be the third presentation this morning. Um, again, following that same theme of allowing the public to participate in the deliberative process, we're going to hear from Grania Curtin from the Policing Authority, who's going to give us insights into how they are using technology to reach beyond just, I suppose, the usual suspects in terms of organisations who will inevitably make submissions on policing issues and to engage a much more widespread cohort to get insights into a hugely important area of policing priorities for Ireland. So, Grania, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Can I just check that you can hear me? Great. Yeah, I can certainly hear you, Grania. Thanks. Perfect. There wasn't sound with the video. I don't know if there was supposed to be. Um... There was supposed to be. So there's a bit of a glitch there. Apologies, everyone. No problem. Well, I think the subtitles conveyed it. the message very yeah. capably. So no problems there. Everyone had to do a little bit of extra work by reading it as well. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. We can replay after with um, volume again if needs be. Sorry about that, folks. 
No, so um, yeah, as you just saw, um, Facing Priorities set out the most important things that the Garda Síochána are directing their efforts and resources to in any given year. So an example of a facing priority would be organised crime or hate crime or anti-corruption. Uh, the policing authority currently has responsibility for establishing the policing priorities and it's on the basis then of these priorities that the Garda Commissioner will um, develop his annual policing plan. So one of the steps in establishing the policing priorities is to carry out a public consultation. So in the past, the vast majority of responses to these consultations have been from the likes of NGOs and civil society stakeholders and other public bodies. So while um, these responses have been meaningful and valuable, I suppose what was missing was the input of the individual citizen. So we were looking for a way to sort of reach past these organisations and um, give an opportunity to individuals to have an input in these important policing matters. Now, we were also looking for a way of doing that, which, you know, wouldn't add too much in terms of a burden for analysis for ourselves. Um, so the solution um, the solution came to us in the form of the simulator. So this is a piece of off the shelf software from a UK company called DLib. Um, I'm going to just do a little demo at the end, but um, I suppose in the meantime, just to put it simply, um, it's an interactive exercise. The consultee um, gets a list of priorities and a finite number of points on which they can spend on their priorities as they see fit. Um, so, as we all know, not everything can be a priority and the consultee is kind of forced to make some choices. Um, so, um, th I think there's kind of an educational piece there as well, I suppose, because you're kind of putting it back on the consultee to kind of understand the difficult decisions that have to be made. The software was de developed by gamers, so I think it has a kind of a gamey sort of fun feel to it, I think. Um, in 2020, we applied to the Public Service Innovation Fund um, and we were funded to um, buy this software. Uh, so thanks, Tifa. Um, so the public consultation took place in May of this year um, with a busy communications campaign running alongside it. Um, so we used the imagery from the animated video that you saw earlier to create a series of clear, simple, consistent images that could be disseminated along with the video across social media and other platform, other digital platforms. So you'll just see an example of that there on the slides on the left hand side. Um, we also worked with Nala uh, when we were populating the software to make sure that everything was written in plain English and as accessible as possible and just to kind of, I suppose, check ourselves and make sure we didn't get kind of carried away with our policing terminology and uh, technical language. We have a program of stakeholder engagement, which is quite active and um, we would use feedback that we would get um, from stakeholder organisations, everything from victims groups to people representing minority communities. And that would feed into and inform our work in a number of ways all the time. So I suppose this meant that we had an existing um, relationship with a whole network of stakeholder organisations across NGOs and civil society. And we relied heavily on these relationships and these organisations to help us to get the message out to as diverse a range of communities as possible. So you'll just see an example of that there. Um, just some, that's just some of the support that we got from our stakeholders. So from the likes of Women's Aid and um, the Irish Network Against Racism. We ran a small advertising campaign. So that included Facebook ads, Twitter ads and Instagram ads. Um, one online news outlet and also we did two uh, print newspaper ads. We also had a press campaign so we did a series of interviews our chief executive um, on uh, regional and national radio and we actually kind of stepped outside our normal channels a little bit for this like so for example one of the interviews was on the Louise McSharry show which probably would have kind of opened us up to maybe like a fresh audience and introduced us to them. So uh, just in terms of the engagement that we got, so we had almost three and a half thousand responses. In general, 
the feedback was very positive. It seemed that people found it user friendly and they found it accessible. Um, we ended up with a fairly robust sample. So considering this was convenient sampling, people were self-selecting. Um, so it, it wasn't a representative sample of the population, but we, we still ended up with a fairly robust sample. So you'll see there on the slides, 80% were Irish, and you can see there that ethnic minority groups were slightly underrepresented. And then in terms of age, you have the kind of younger cohorts and the older cohorts that are slightly underrepresented. So it's useful then for us to have that kind of um, information because we can supplement um, those cohorts then through our other work, such as stakeholder engagement, for speaking to those people. Um, Perhaps unsurprisingly, in terms of the results, the things that people prioritized at uh, the top three were uh, um, sexual assault and child sex sexual abuse and um, assaults in public and domestic abuse. And then on the other end of the scale, you had things sort of things relating to kind of guard systems and structures. And um, those would be the things I suppose that are a little bit less visible to people. So I think they probably didn't get as much attention for that reason. Um, so I will just, uh, if you don't mind, Owen, play uh, a quick screen recording just to kind of bring it to life for you a little bit, just so you can see how the um, <clears throat> how the software looks. Sorry, folks, bear with, just having an issue. One second. Just while it's loading, Grania, I'm just interested, the three and a half thousand, did you have a sense of an expected number or anything like that? Yeah, it was very difficult to predict, actually. Like, I, I was kind of hoping for something in and around that, and it kind of depended, you know, with the advertising, how much bounce there was from different things. I had kind of hoped for something in and around that, actually, yeah. But probably would have been satisfied with a lot less. Yeah, mm, yeah no, it's a very satisfying number, for sure. Right, I think we're about... Yep. Great. Brilliant, yeah. So, as you can just see here, there are a number of um, uh, policing areas on the left-hand side. And then within each area, there are a number of policing priorities. So each policing priority then has a little information button. So that'll just give you a bit of a background and a bit of an explainer, especially around the kind of terminology. Um, each priority then has a sliding scale from zero to five, as you can see. So you just work your way down through the priorities and allocating the points as you see fit. Obviously, you'd be giving careful consideration uh, in reality. You can always see the points spent and the points remaining at the top then at any one time. So as you can see here, just kind of wearing them down. We've overspent now. Uh oh, we're going to have to go back. We're going to have to adjust and make some tough choices. And so then you can't you can't finish it out until your balance is at zero. Uh, so that is the simulator. I hope that kind of helps to bring it to life for you a little bit. I suppose what I would say in conclusion is that the, the software is great, but it really was the kind of combined effort of the software being so effective and the um, communications campaign and the existing stakeholder network, I think, that, that made this consultation a success. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much, Grania. Yeah, again, absolutely fascinating stuff. Um, the one thing that really struck me powerfully from it was that idea of the necessity of choice. And again, you know, when you're empowering the community to participate, um, it actually takes away that sometimes, you know, a lot of the kind of populist frustration and you can tune into Joe Duffy or whatever, and why don't they do more of this? Why don't they? where you're actually presenting them with a real tool to say to understand that you can do more of this but the cost is to do less of that um, and i just think that is it's such a powerful message i'm interested in i suppose the um the impact of the sort of digital element of the consultation in terms of 
whether you have a sense that that influenced the respondents in terms of their age cohort, their ethnic makeup or anything like that. I mean, like it's a very powerful way to reach out to people, but I'm wondering, does it skew the response, do you think? Yeah, I think it possibly could. Like, I would imagine in the future doing this in a, a non pandemic environment, it would be great to go on the road with it as well. You know, like bring a bunch of iPads, you know, go out to kind of meet those communities where they are, meet older people where they are, meet minority communities and, you know, talk them through it and kind of have maybe a bit of an event around it to just make it a bit more accessible. So rather than kind of expecting people to, to stumble upon it online that we would go and reach those communities. So, yeah, I definitely think we could do it differently in a post pandemic world. Yeah, thanks. So that's, yeah, that's the bit I was, and, and I suppose in some ways I'm kind of feeding the age old prejudice about uh, digitally illiterate older people, which I think even your, your statistics would suggest mm. doesn't yeah. stand up in this case, but um, it's obviously you're trying to reach as wide a cross section of the community as possible. And I'm curious as well about your, and I know in policing, I really shouldn't use the term usual suspects, but the people that all of those NGOs and other groups that would have been sort of your traditional, I suppose, points of contact, um, do they feel undermined or anything in this process or? Um, not that I've heard, but I suppose we did also use them, I guess, to, um, to kind of get the message out on our behalf. So I suppose we still were kind of bringing them along and they knew what we were doing and they were engaged with it. And I suppose for a lot of them, knowing that their members could participate maybe was even more valuable than actually being able to, you know, write a submission themselves. So no, I think, I think we kind of brought them along sufficiently and um, that they, you know, they were still involved in the process just in a different way. Okay, yeah, that's really interesting. Cause again, obviously we all have, I think in every organization, some like say for example in, in in i work in tax and it's we have a sort of a liaison committee of accountants and lawyers and so on and you they actually sometimes get nervous when we go out and ask mm -hmm. the taxpaying community directly so again yeah it's really important to balance your sort of regular sources with these powerful new sources um we have a question on software and setup and so on um was this an expensive project and was it a, a large scale project in terms of setting up the software to run the operation? So in terms of setup, it's an off the shelf product. Um, it's a UK company called DLib. Um, so it was ready to go, um, which is great. They have a couple of different kind of um, digital democracy type products. Um, cost then, so the cost of a one year subscription to the simulator is 6,000 euro plus VAT. Um, so, I mean, great value and also you can use, you can, um, use for multiple consultations. So possibly like a larger agency or a large government department could actually maybe be running 3 of these in, in a period of time. So. Yeah, thanks. That's it's, it's extremely powerful for the price and, mm. and I did hear it correctly this time as opposed to my 2000 instead of 20 the last time that's just an annual subscription and, and you have. In, in terms of. The number of consultations or the number of people who can participate that's all falls within that 6,000. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. No matter how many, yeah, it's infinite. So, yeah, it's great, great value. The other thing that just again just struck me looking at it was that, um, the design of the questions, um, and obviously of necessity, this has to be limited. People are making choices, people are awarding the points you've given them to award. Um, did you get any feedback in terms of well, why didn't you consider X or Y or were yes. people generally happy that you got the spectrum right? Um, yeah, so we included an open text box as well, actually, um, in between when you fill out your, um, when you fill out the simulator and there's demographic data, but there's also an open text box. And I think that is important. Like you need to give an opportunity to people who don't find what they expected or what's really important to them in the list. And um, so, yeah, no, of course there were, there were definitely things that were left out and people, a lot of people would have very specific concerns as well. You know, like sometimes you could almost see interest groups and things like that, but you know, that's interesting for us to be aware of as well. What, you know, what's out there, what might be coming in the future or what people are concerned about. But I think the open text box is important. Yeah. To give people that opportunity and not just a finite list of priorities. Yeah, and again, it takes away, and that's really good to hear because it also takes away that idea of, you know, that you know mm. what's good for them, as it were, that you're actually giving that opportunity for that participative element in the, the question space to 
Brilliant. Listen, thanks a million for that, Grania. I know we'll come back to you in the discussion at the end, but we'll, so, and again, really fascinating presentation and genuine participation. Um, we're going to move on, uh, hopefully, back to Niall um, to hear how people do get to make those budgetary choices in South Dublin County Council and hopefully with audio this time. Thanks very much. I hope I'm here. I had one of those uh, how to feel probably in the Eurovision moments when it cuts to them and they can't hear the null points or whatever. <laughs> but you're loud and clear now. <laughs> if you give me one second, I'll set this up here and I'll take you through 300k have your say in South Dublin County Council. And do. And it's a project we're very uh, proud of. We've launched it in 2017. Um, and the slide should pop up now. So. And if you can see my slides there, can you? You just need to fix your display settings on. Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry. No problem. Smile. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, yeah, so like I say, 300K have your say. It's um, it's a personal budgeting project we've run. We, we're the first, con we're the first uh, Council local authority in the state who have actually um, set up a project like this. It's um, so we're very very proud of it. Like you're saying, it's about really about getting people uh, to make to take 300k extra funding from our annual budget, and to uh, to decide really what they want to want to spend it on in their uh, area. They come up with the project ideas. We put we shortlist it internally and we put it out to a public vote. So um, in terms of actually getting citizens on board, it's um, extremely kind of positive. Um, so just to take you through what I'm going to look at today, it's just a brief overview of the initiative itself. The uh, very short look at historical context of participatory budgeting, our own internal process, how we engage our citizens, um, the type of results we've seen in projects funded, uh, the future of the initiative, and what we've learned throughout as well in terms of that engagement piece. So, 300K is, uh, like I was saying, is a participatory budgeting PB initiative uh, that we've run uh, first time in a pilot project in Lucan in 2017. Um, and it really allows residents to develop their own project proposals for the local area, think about what they want to see for their community, um, and then decide in a public ballot as to what they want us to implement uh, up, to, up to the amount of 300,000. So, like I was saying, we're the first local authority in the state who have done an initiative like this. I think there are some other local authorities planning on running some some in the near future. Um, but for ourselves, what we do is one per year, uh, we go into a selected local electoral area that is chosen by our mayor at a council meeting. Um, usually it's at the annual council meeting that we have when the new mayor comes on board for the year. And obviously for 2020, we were, we didn't run run a PB, but we're back this year in Tallis Central. Um, and in terms of it, it has been won or been shortlisted for a number of awards. Um, the Department of Public Expansion and Reform have selected it as well as one of their key case studies. And we worked with the IPA uh, to develop that report that you'll be, you can find um, for improving citizen engagement under the Our Public Service 2020 Development and Innovation Framework. So just to put it in a very brief historical context of what participatory budgeting is, uh, if you're un unaware of uh, the term or um, what, what it actually is, so it, it actually originated in Porto Alegre in Brazil in 1989 and has since spread worldwide to the United States, Portugal, India, Ireland, obviously, and many other countries. And it is adapted by local governments for local circumstances, so you'll find that there's a lot of different variations of it. But at the moment, there's around, roughly around about 7,000 uh, initiatives happening worldwide, of which we're just one. Uh, for our internal process, it's run through the communications unit that I manage, but it's really given its direction by a steering group that comprises of senior officials within the council, um, elected members. That, that steering group is chaired by the, the sitting mayor. 
and it's broken into four phases that you can see here, which is from the establishment of the, that, that year's initiative through to the submissions phase, through to shortlisting. And the shortlisting is, the shortlisting is carried out by senior management within the council, so up at, dire, at director level, where we get around the table, sit down, look at what's come in, and set it out against the criteria we have for have your say, and decide what can go forward for the public vote. Um, and then for the public vote itself, uh, that that would run usually around November or December in a given year. And running it with that mix of elected members and officials in this way, I think has been crucial really in garnering support from, from our elected members, helping to push it out and to getting their input into all stages of the initiative from the communications plan through to the workshops through to the projects that, that are selected to go forward um, and then through to the implementation phase as well. In practice, like I was saying, we have one running in Talis Central at the moment. So it launches in September with our comm strategy workshops and the submissions phase is open at the moment until October 8. At that stage, we'll go through that internal uh, shortlisting and then we'll move it into the public vote. It goes to the council meeting in November, the shortlist would. And once it's approved at council, we put it up for the public vote. And we do, uh, for the voting stage, we have printed ballots in selected locations in the, in the, the electoral area. And we also do online voting as well. So they've got two chances of uh, getting their votes into us. Um, and then we have a results night in December where we announce what has been funded. When it comes to engaging our uh, citizens in the given electoral area, um, essentially we try to reach everyone within that area that we can through several channels. Have Your Say is open for people of all ages and backgrounds to take part. So we do try to bring as many voices to the table as possible. We have some very strong community groups and community members within our county um, that take part in consultations that are very active within their communities and very active in engaging with the council. But this we find is a way that we can reach those people who maybe don't ever think about contacting the council or don't ever think about getting involved in a consultation. Um, so we have loads of different ways we do this. We have a dedicated website that is important, particularly when it comes to implementing the projects. Um, or sorry, telling our people, telling the citizens when it comes to implementing the projects, um, what's going on with the projects that they've voted for. So that uh, just a one-stop shop where they can drop in, check what's happening with it, what the timelines are, when it's launching. Because if you get people taking part and you obviously want to keep them updated, it's constantly going back to them with information. So we have the website launch event. We do a flyer drop through to every household and business within that electoral, electoral area for Tala Central for this year. Um, we do local press and media. We do bus shelter campaigns. We do social media campaigns with targeted advertising. We've really found with the targeted advertising, it's vital for, um, for an initiative like this because we really want to you, to get people involved, I think localizing uh, messaging is vital. So not only uh, to try and reach people in Tala, for example, for this year, uh, in Tala Central, but to try and bring it down to their areas, for example, like Kingswood or Kilnamana within Tala, and try and get them to think about their own local areas, down to even their own streets. They can, they can propose projects for their streets, for their estates, for their communities, or for Tala in general, so trying to localize that kind of um, information to really get people thinking about what they would love to see in their own communities. Um, and we've found, especially through Facebook and Instagram, where you can target people down to that kind of very local level, it's been very vital for the success of the project. We do community workshops, we reach out to our community and social groups, we go to areas like faith centers to try and get new communities involved. And really, it's about trying to reach people wherever they are um, and deliver this information to them repeatedly to get them involved. So uh, when in, terms, in terms of council meetings and area committees, we keep our elected members updated throughout, and that goes all the way through to implementation. Direct email is one I just want to touch on um, because I think it's an, it's an important one that maybe gets overlooked sometimes. Um, our submission process is extremely simple. It's uh, we ask people to give a title for their project and we ask them to give a brief description and uh, a potential location for it. 
takes about roughly five minutes to carry out, but we also ask them for their email address. And the reason we do this is so that when it comes to the shortlisting phase, we can go back to those people and particularly the ones whose projects maybe aren't advancing or having amalgamated into, if we had five similar projects, we amalgamated into one project for the public vote. We go back and we explain this to them. Um, here's a reason why your project did go forward. Here's a reason why your project didn't go forward. Um, I think it's a vital piece of customer service and customer care because this is a very positive initiative, but obviously uh, that can turn to a negative for some people if they work on an idea, submit it, and then to find out it hasn't gone to a public vote and they have no explanation as to why that happened. You can see how that, that could upset people. So going back and taking the time to explain it to them, I think is crucial because they took the time to get involved. So it's, the, the onus is really on us to go back and take the time uh, to talk to them and answer their questions around your project and um, why it didn't advance or why it didn't advance. And we try multilingual messaging as well, Try because we are a very diverse county, so we, we try to reach again as many people as possible. So in terms of results, you can see there for ideas submitted, workshops, participants, projects shortlisted, um, ballots cast and winning projects for our first three years of Have Your Say. Um, Fair House Born Brina especially really shot ahead in terms of votes. I think the reason for that was there was a number of strong communities there who had worked on transformative project ideas for their communities. And they all wanted to win. They got competitive about it. They all wanted uh, to get their funding, obviously. Um, and because we provide that both online and in-person voting at selected locations, we had reports coming in of things like entire sc school classes in Borna Brina, for example, after a day, they did all the teachers arrange for all the class to march down to the to cast their ballot, to use one of the printed ballots. And when you think about it, they're primary school kids, so that's their first um, first time taking part in democracy, and I think that's that's pretty special, particularly because they got their project funded, so they can see their vote it can matter, and hopefully to take that forward with them um, into adult life. So. The types of projects we've seen come true, I'll touch on these briefly, but these are very diverse projects, but you, we get playgrounds and we want a new playground for a community. We've had things like uh, Heritage Trail apps for Clondalk and we've developed that off the back of funding for Have Your Say, and it's been such a success, it's gonna be rolled out throughout the county. We've seen ideas like a scoping study for, um, for gender-based violence and aggression in public spaces come through this, where this was just one person sat at home, and I think this shows the power of it. It was one person sat at home in their living room who saw an ad for this, who this had been on their mind, like someone should do this, this scoping study or research project into gender-based aggression on public uh, spaces. And they just put their idea in, uh, it was shortlisted and it was selected by the public for funding for 25,000 for that for their research. And I don't know where the funding for something like that would have come from otherwise for us. And, and the fact that someone just did it from the living room one night, it, I think is absolutely fantastic. Uh, we've seen apple trees in community orchards, teenage spaces, Christmas festivals, and when it comes to implementation, I think bottle bank, this is one project bottle banks in Clondalk and that was important to go back to people on where it couldn't be carried out for a reason where we didn't have public land in the very, in the community where they wanted it. And we went to various private uh, enterprises to see if they would allow us to put them up in car parks there, um, or areas like that, and we, we couldn't get agreement to get these bottle banks uh, placed anywhere. So we went back to the public and we told them that, we went to elected members and we told them that throughout, we kept them updated. And I think it's important as an, nearly as an educational tool where the people who are interacting with us around us now hopefully understand that, yes, th these ideas are fantastic and we all want to see you know, more recycling centers, more everything, but, uh, the actual implementation carrying out those projects from the council, you can hit snags and it doesn't mean that we don't want to do these things, but it means that we are, we're working through these things and we're, uh, but for some, some projects we can't do, some projects might be slowed down for a variety of reasons, but it's not us not wanting to do these things, it's us trying to work through the actual delivery of um, things like bottle banks or any project. And for the future, as I say, Talis Central is ongoing. We have two local electoral areas left after that. I'm sure we'll do a, a review of the initiative then. And we're going to do, we, we do campaigns throughout to highlight the projects, but we're going to do one big anti-promotional campaign at the end anyway to highlight all the projects, everything that's come through, 
the ones that maybe couldn't go forward, all that sort of stuff, do the educational piece around it and really show the power of this um, initiative. And what we've learned very quickly, because I know we're running out of time, is remember that everything is local, localize that messaging as much as possible to get people involved. Digital campaigning has been vital, I think, for the success of this. So if anyone's thinking of setting this up, I would say put your money there if you have a limited uh, communications budget. Uh, and sure, there's someone just over having a look at the initiative, just keeping an eye on the projects uh, for the implementation, because we do get questions on that. Uh, communicating that implementation is key. The elected members, we've been blessed with how great, uh, how, how much they've rolled in behind us and helped mold it and shape it. Um, so we've been very lucky with, with our elected members, but their buy-in is key for an, an initiative like this. And this isn't Field of Dreams, and what I mean by that is just because you're giving people 300,000 spender in community, if you build it, they're not necessarily going to come unless you tell them repeatedly how great this is, how transformative this could be, and you keep bringing it to where they are uh, at all times and keep just push it, pushing it out there and pushing it out there and pushing it out there. And if you do that enough, uh, I think you'll find that people do get involved and those that do get involved actually have really good experience with it and it will increase uh, their satisfaction with your with, with your local authority or with, with your department. And thank you for that. Thanks very much, Niall. <clears throat> Certainly, we didn't get you the first time around, but it was well worth waiting for. Um, fascinating <laughs> insight into a sort of really successful experiment in participation. Um, just I have a question or two for you, but just before I do, just to remind everybody that the Q&A is open to you, both for Niall and for all the panelists for, for the panel conversation that's to come. Um, so don't forget it's there. Now, it's, it's really wonderful, I think, to see. And, and the one thing that struck me, actually, if you pull it together with the other two projects is um, because we all might think, ah, yeah. That, that stuff, that participative stuff is grand, but my operation is too big or too small. I mean, we've had a whole town, we've had the whole country in terms of policing priorities, and then we've had the subset that is an electoral area, and, and we're working at all those levels. So I think sort of any, any naysayers in the audience, um, I think we're all running out of excuses as to how this, as to why this type of participative activity can't work. But I am curious about, I mean, let's put it bluntly, do you get mad stuff in this? um we can do <laughs> we, but but uh they all have value and they all like if this is what people are saying that they want to see you you you, you can get ones where it's just not suitable for whether that's because of a cost reason you you, you get people saying um we want you to buy uh heritage center we want you to buy this this old building that's worth about two million for this um but my, one of the ones we've got for this one is that they want us to buy a house and raffle it off <laughs> um, to do do that, for, that's one one project that we've got in. But we do get a lot of. I think there's a lot of people who put a lot of thought into this. There's a lot of people who have had an idea in the back of their mind for a long time that they've wanted to see in their community. And if you can tell them that this is your potential avenue uh, to getting that developed into a real project, I, I, I think I, what we found is that uh, people are ready to jump in it. Just fantastic. Like there's a real sense of I think maturity in the. The public engagement space that's coming through from it. There's one piece that I'm really interested in, and that's kind of even looking at your flow chart of it. There's an obvious bottleneck in the middle, which is the shortlisting process, mm. because this is where we you step outside the participative democracy, and a bunch of officials and elected representatives go, mm, "That's in, that's out." Um, I suppose, other than obviously you're looking for practical stuff and stuff that works and that, but is that a vulnerable piece? I mean, are you subject to lobbying or are the councillors subject to lobbying around that part of it? Or... Well, well, what we've done is, and some of this was coming out of the pilot initiative, but we've developed a set of criteria that we do update if and if we've if we need to from the implementation of certain projects. So, uh, and we stick to that criteria very rigidly, as in we can only exclude a project if it doesn't meet that criteria. So I can give you an example. Um, so if we don't, if there's no space for public land within the area identified by the project, so some of them, again, do bring it down to their estate uh, level. But if there's no public land there, then we can't guarantee that that project will be able to be implemented. 
So we don't allow it to go to public vote because if we do do that, then it'll only lead to disappointment and we can't carry it out. We, we, we learned that through one of the projects in Lucan, which was about providing access to the public to an old church and graveyard. But to do that, and that, that, that was funded at the time, but to do it, we had to cross over private land. So we would have had to get an agreement from the private landowner and he, for his own very valid reasons, did not want to provide that. He had a gate put up for to stop scramblers from coming into to his fields, potentially wrecking them. So he wasn't willing to take down the scramblers. That means we couldn't provide access to people in wheelchairs, to people that were buggies, to a variety of people. So we couldn't carry out that project. So oh, that's okay. why we so... now ask for public land instead of uh, private land. So there, it's areas like that where we learn as we go along. Yeah, but that's really interesting because I think if if I if I can summarize what you're saying, then I mean, it's not the shortlisting is not a case of what you guys in officialdom think is better. It's only what you can recognize as feasible exactly. and re reasonable, and you go back and explain that to people. So yeah, and so I think that's not, scope for lobbying or abuse in the shortlisting. Exactly, and I think that I think that's an important piece because it does give us something to stand behind. When we go back to people, um, like the other one is there's no ongoing cost beyond the years, so we, we're not going to put on five years worth of classes for someone or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and elected members understand that and they're behind that as well. So they go out and explain to people when they get questions in as well. And again, like we go back to people through that customer care piece and we explain to them, this is the reason. Here's the criteria and it didn't meet, meet that one, unfortunately. And the voting process, I mean, I'm, I'm curious, I mean, you're, <sighs> without putting words in your mouth, you seem comfortable with a certain amount of, I think the word manipulation is too strong, but you know, where people organize a whole class to go and vote for something. And I totally take your point that it's wonderful to encourage that kind of participation. But on the other hand, it basically means that whoever organizes a good campaign is likely to come out on top. Are, are, are you comfortable with how that sways the overall process? We do. There is certain elements I don't think you can control. We do put on a two-step process for the online vote, uh, where you get sent a text message and you have to click on a link to, uh, to to make it valid. That's to cut out people using fake phone numbers, for example. And we do find most of our votes do come in through the online process. So we, we do have put measures in, in that area, but there is nothing to stop someone from texting, or sorry, to put, you doing the online vote and walking down to the library and also doing a print vote. We haven't found anything anecdotally. Um, we do check over all these votes at the end and we do go through through, through the numbers just to make sure there's nothing that stands out um, looking, looking like vote rigging or anything like that. And we do have people on, yeah. working on boxes so they can't come along and stuff the ballot boxes if, if someone tried to do it. We do have staff members there on the day uh, monitoring it. So we do, we, do, we do have these safeguards in place it's not foolproof, but um, but we, yeah, we have, we have thought about that. And we, from what we've heard and what feedback we've got, we, we're quite comfortable in that um, the votes have all been kind of valid. And um, there might, I'm sure there's been one or two people who have done that, who have voted twice through the, through the online and the print, but sure, we, we can live with that, I think. <laughs> Vote early and often. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much, Niall. That was a re really, really interesting. Um, and as I say, it just gives you that sense that you can do this at almost any scale. That whole piece, I'm just going to open it up to the to the panel now. And just in case any of your fellow speakers are starting to relax in any way, um, <laughs> that that whole sort of piece that we were just touching on there about, I suppose, how stuff gets accepted, rejected. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of really interested in the implications of all of this for trust uh, between ourselves and citizens. Because when you open up a process, you create certain expectations, everybody has their say, and then it gets narrowed back down to, to choices. And that leads to a certain amount of, of disappointment, um, potentially. Uh, and I know you've talked now yourself about that uh, in terms of getting back to people to say why their ideas haven't happened or whatever, just maybe to, to take in um, Grania or Ashling. Um, maybe we got, might go to yourself, Grania, in the first instance, because again, you've got those, you know, the people coming back to you as well saying, well, why didn't you include this, that or the other in terms of the policing priorities? I didn't, like, 
are there risks to trust within the process? Yeah, I see what you mean. And I suppose for us anyway, the public consultation is just one step in the process of establishing the policing priorities. And in fact, that process isn't complete yet. Um, so we did the public consultation back in May, then we would have done like, you know, jurisdictional analysis, look what's happening worldwide, like pestle analysis, looking at our own environment. And it's uh, the draft priorities are actually going to the authority tomorrow. So we'll see, we'll see how that goes. And um, it'll go for cons consultation to the Garda Commissioner after that. So I suppose the white knuckle ride at the moment. Yeah, like I do hope that we'll be able to um, publish something, I suppose, that shows how, how we did, even if it's not obvious the first time you look at it, but how it shows that we, you know, we were able to take these on board, but it remains to be seen actually. Yeah, the process is still ongoing for us at the moment. Yeah, and of course you have, I'd, I've nearly forgotten that, of course, you have the challenge that the ultimate decisions aren't entirely in your hands, that you then have to engage with on Garda Shirkana themselves as well. And obviously there are organisational limitations there too. And it is, it's really, yeah, thanks for that. I think that's maybe my turn to Ashling as well again, because because planning is something that has, I suppose, traditionally, there have been challenges with, with public trust with service providers and I'm not sort of going back to it but but even because ultimately there will always be some cohort in society that thinks the planners are arrogant and they're designing things that aren't good for them um, do you think that this kind of participative model is just helping to to build trust or do you perceive risks in that and that you're giving people the impression they'll have their say and then ultimately they don't get what they want yeah, I, I, I think in general knowledge is power. So I think the more that we can give uh, information to the citizen throughout the process, it, it, I suppose, doesn't eliminate the negative feedback you'll get on, on whatever plans that you're putting forward for a town or village. But I suppose giving, giving um, feedback to the the citizen ongoing feedback as to the, like um what Niall had said there about one of I think it was the bottle bank project, you know, this is why we can't do this and having that dialogue in place after a public consultation is really, really important. It's difficult to do because it kind of it, it takes manpower um and resources. Um but ultimately for the projects that, that we've be working on and with the 3D model by giving people, I suppose, um, the ongoing engagement of a particular plan has definitely been helpful to get people on board um, and to inform them as to maybe why we can't do seating in this way or we can't do all green areas because of if it's you know, we need to be wheelchair friendly and, and just explaining certain aspects to a plan is definitely helpful um, in the public consultation process. Okay, thanks, Ashley. And again, I think pulling together all three there, um, a very clear sense that the thing that helps to protect the trust piece is the feedback. Um, and that seems to be a hugely significant piece. We have a, a question in from the audience around the sort of how much of the planning was internal to the organization and how much external support and expertise do you need? And maybe just allied to that, I think, because th there's a whole question in there about, I suppose, organizational change as well, um, in the sense that um, we as public servants, we're all used to designing our own ways of doing things. And there's, there are certain risks, obviously, in throwing it out to the world outside. And obviously you've colleagues within the organization who may be more or less supportive of this, Glasnost this invitation to um, just while I have you there, I think I might, and then I'll go around the panel on that. That sense of organizational change, internal support for the process. Is that an issue for you? Um, I wouldn't say it's an issue. I think with COVID, the technology has played quite a substantial role in the way we work um, and moving to things like this online events and um, working remotely. So uh, digital tools maybe beforehand would have had a bit more of a, a backlash or a little harder to get um, certain departments or people on board, but we've kind of had to change substantially overnight. Um, so the likes of having 
you know, a, a 3D model in development when all of this happened was really helpful because we could communicate plans um, digitally and um, which, you know, the, the consultation on the development plan, I know likewise with South Dublin, we created uh, online uh, virtual rooms where you could view development plans um, in a more inversive way. So um, I would say that actually for this reason and getting people bought into new technologies, COVID has actually helped probably push that door wide open. Brilliant. Yeah, it's it's like so nobody wants to say good things about COVID, but at the same time, I think we'll all acknowledge that we got catapulted forward in a lot of ways in, in, in ways of working on that. Niall, if I might turn to you again on that sort of organizational piece. Um, the um, Obviously, people like town planners very used to being in, in control of their own agenda and that people like councillors very used to be in control of their agenda. Was there a big sell internally in terms of getting this to happen? No, um, it, I think the original idea and it was actually before I, before I actually joined South Dublin County Council, but it was, it was developed with elected members and senior officials from the get go. Um, so they had the buy in from the elected members right from the right from the start. And it was brought up to director level as well, where they 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 on the steering group, um, where they really let out and they really helped shape the whole thing. So when you have that buy-in from the top, when you have it from the elected members, um, it it really took off within South Dublin County Council. Um, when it comes to internally, I, and when I went back to I think I said in the slide, we're having someone having an, an oversight of the projects that do get funded. Um, what we've found with that is just so that because those projects when they get funded go out to a variety of departments and sections within those departments. So just having someone who's just talking to those people and saying, here's what the project was, here's how much you got, here's what the ideas were, and then going back for updates on those just so that there's internally, because obviously you're, you're handing projects to people who are quite busy and but you, you sell it to them in that way the person internally does and say, well, this is actually really, really good. Um, and then you go back and you get the updates from them. Um, but we've found that people internally down to sections who are, who are implementing it, they kind of do see the value of it now. They've seen how much is taken off and how much the public actually do quite like it. Um, so we, we don't have much of an, an issue there. And when it comes to doing uh, digital voting in areas like that as well, I think there was some concern at one stage around, do you know, we need to keep the print ballots and we do need to keep the print ballots, but we have found that everyone from taking part from putting in the ideas and putting and voting have from across ages and backgrounds are all comfortable now being being online doing it that way as well so I, I think that fear factor people have with doing the online part of it i think that that that, that should probably go away now after COVID. Excellent. Yeah, thanks very much. You're, you're, you're reminding me of the famous Bertie Ahern quote that we couldn't go into the, I think he said 20th century, with the, the, the pencil on the string in our hands. <laughs> and it's, it's really good to see that sort of cross community engagement with, with digital. Um, I, th there's a good chat going on in the questions and answers, so which is, which is great and people are answering directly because um, I'm conscious of time um, and this t subject is so fascinating that um, time is running out. But certainly I, I was picking up on one of the somebody posed the question of Vincent O'Reilly that I was pursuing as well separately was that whole idea and I might come back to yourself Gronia to, to finish on this because we've touched on it with um, both Ashling and Niall and that is the organisational cultural piece um, like selling this way of working within your own organisation. Um, yeah so for us I think people were, were pretty excited about it actually we had just moved to a matrix structure of working and this was probably one of the first projects to sort of realize that structure. So we weren't working in our existing team. So we like pulled together, we had an IT person, we had someone who was a bit more of an expert in policing. I work in communications and engagement. So actually I think that culturally is a great way actually of pushing things forward. If you're pulling people from different parts of the organization, it's a great way I think to get support and buy-in. Now we're also a small organization, so we can usually be quite agile um, with things like this. So yeah, I think. Yeah, that's it's it's really positive to hear. Um, that's what I'm getting getting a sense from all three participants, and obviously 
like yours is a relatively new organization. Um, the councils are much longer established, but uh, I, I think the sense that's coming across is that you're not experiencing organizational resistance. Um, and, that, and that's really positive because we are talking about something quite fundamental. As I say, we, we public servants, we're very good at designing stuff and we kind of think we know what's what's right. So, as I say, in, inviting people to participate and, and finding that you're not experiencing that cultural resistance again is, is just a really positive message. And I think it's, you know, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of, of, of the takeaways from the three presentations and the conversations that flowed from them is that sense that, look, this stuff really works. Organizations of every size and dealing with every sort of sized cohort of the community can take advantage of it and that you are getting the internal organizational support and the other piece and again looking at some of the questions that have been flowing and people have been answering apart from some limited concerns about reporting on particular tools and things like that in general the the tool sets we're not talking about huge advanced but obviously the 3d modeling is it's an investment because of the particular tool and that but you know the the software is there and available to do that. Um, so really positive stuff. I'm kind of coming to to the end of the morning. So I mean, again, like lots of conversations, as I say, taking place in, in, in the sidebar as well. And obviously through the platform, there will be opportunities afterwards for people to continue to sort of annoy the speakers because you've been so fascinating that inevitably people have more questions for you. For now, I really just want to say a huge thanks again to Ashling to Grania and to Niall, um, and to the people who've been posting in their questions. It's it's just really great to see that level of participation and really strong messages coming out from this. And I think these are messages that help us to build towards we've been looking with the steering group at the 8th of December event. Um, it's still not fully taken shape, but very much looking at that whole sphere of digital service delivery, digital interaction, both the positives and the negatives. And we've talked about the risks of digital exclusion and how we manage that across age cohorts, ability cohorts. Again, really interesting to see um, the adult literacy for life report and strategy published recently. And one of the big messages coming out of that, that some 47% of our adult population suffer from some degree of limitations to their digital literacy. And that's really powerful, something for all of us. And, and what struck me from this morning's presentation was the ease and simplicity of the interactive platforms that are being provided. And again, a really powerful message in that. But although I do have to remind myself that ease and simplicity to me may not be to somebody else. And that's where that whole sort of universal design concepts that we've talked about in this network before kind of come into play. So again, just a huge thanks for that really fascinating, um, as I say, I hope you have the 8th of December in your diaries. That's um, coming up soon enough and we are working on putting shape on it. And Grace and Caroline, who are as ever the backbone behind making all of these things work, uh, along with the, the steering group, our action team have been putting a lot of effort into that as well. I know there's a couple of uh, items of update from Grace or Caroline. I'll just pass over to yourselves now. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for great presentations. Really, really interesting to, to hear the, the new stuff that's happening. Um, yeah, it's a couple of um, themes that we're looking at pursuing um, uh, that we're looking at um, doing, doing a bit of research into. And we want to see if um, any of your organizations have done research into to these areas and if, if, if you could share um, those research findings with us or insights. Um, so the topic we're, we want to look into is around employee engagement and the link to quality of service design. There, there are studies in other countries, um, we're aware of them in, in the United States and McKinsey consultants have reports on them where they, they've, they've, um, they've looked at employee engagement data and they've looked at, at um, service delivery and quality data and they, they can see that there's um, alignment. So where, where uh, there's positive uh, employee engagement um, messages coming through, um, the, the, it, it tends to be linked with um, positive customer experience, positive customer service. So um, it's a request really to, to any of you in your organizations, if, if you have any data or any research or any insights in, in this kind of area that you could share with us, it, it, it's an area we're, 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 we're trying to explore at the moment. Um, as Breen said, we have the, the, the QCSN forum um, and we, we would invite both the, the panelists today and 
um, attendees, members of the QCSN to join the forum so we can continue these discussions as we're working through, you know, our, our customer service, um, uh, uh, our day to day, we, we might have questions that we don't have the answer to, but can, in sharing them with the forum, somebody else might have the answer. So, um, we'd encourage uh, members to, to join the forum if you haven't already and to, to participate in it. Um, and as, as always, uh, as Brian said, we're looking at um, future topics for future um, events. Um, digitalization is, is, is the one we have in mind for the December event. But if there's a topic of interest to you, if, if there's a research question you want to know more about, if there's a particular speaker you're aware of, you'd like to hear from, um, please contact us and we, we, we we're always looking for ideas and we, and we want to respond to, to your ideas in terms of what we can focus on in, in future events. So. That's our thing. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Just 1 last thing. Um, I posted a link in the chat to, um. And Niall mentioned the, the case study 300 K have your say that that we undertook in, in the OPS team with, with um, academics. There's also, um, we did 4 case studies since this engagement, um, overall, I posted the link to, to. Um, there is an, an overview study done and it shows, um. 10 working principles for, for good this engagement that that. That, that were derived from the lessons identified through the four case studies. So again, you know, having heard the great uh, examples today from panelists, and if you're thinking of, of doing this engagement initiative in your in in your own organization, these principles might might help guide you as well. That's everything. Thank you, Maureen. Thanks very much, Grace. Yeah, that whole area of employee engagement and, and the service delivery link, I, I actually must say just to, I'd endorse Grace's request to you to if there is work, we'd, we'd really love to hear about it. It's it's like one of those areas that on the face of it seems like almost to use a colloquialism, a statement, but leading obvious um, that instinctively we probably all feel that a, a positively engaged, motivated workforce is likely to deliver a higher quality of service. Um, but really would be good to see the extent to which the evidence backs that up because that again, having the evidence gives us all the, the basis for investing in employee engagement. And I know sort of across the civil service in particular, there's been a lot of work done on that in recent years. Um, but it's making those links, understanding them at an empirical, as opposed to an instinctive level is potentially a really valuable piece of how we're going to develop our services into the future. Folks, that brings us to the, to the end of this morning, just to wrap up again, I'd like to say a huge thanks to Ashling, to Niall and to Gronje. Um, really, really fascinating and it's really interesting. I'm just keeping 1 eye on the Q and a box and I can see the conversations are still continuing, which is really the sign of a very successful event. Also, again, a huge thanks to to Grace and to Caroline for and the steering group for the. The huge preparatory work that goes into these things and, and the stuff that goes on. It's the old thing about the, the duck paddling fiercely onto the surface. Uh, special thanks to Owen, who's been managing the technology and rescuing us when when we had to rejig things. And that was really great that we could just rescue flexibly and move forward when we had the few glitches this morning. I was noticed before these events, Caroline especially has a deeply worried look in her face. And I can see she's beginning to smile now. So we've obviously <laughs> We've we've done well. So thanks again to everybody. Thanks for all your participation and we look forward to seeing you at the December event. Take care. Thanks everybody. Bye.